Hey, you guys! It's Grace Ransom with the Words He Is podcast. I'm here today with my brand new friend, Annie. I have known of her for a long time, but we just recently became friends, and I think she's definitely one of my soulmates, and I'm so honored to have you here. Hi, Annie. Hi. No, we became best friends. Yes, we are literally besties. You're my bridesmaid now in a wedding I'm not having yet, so perfect. Yes. Okay, this works out. Tell us about you, Annie. Oh, gosh. You might have to start editing now. Oh, um, no. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work at a coffee shop in Burleson. Yes. Plug them. Um, Where do you work? I work at Dwell. Yeah, you do. I work at Dwell. Have best the best day, day ever. ever. Woo! Um, I like to I like to draw a little bit. I like to do art. I have yes. five animals. And I have an array of, I was going to say of addictions. No. To coffee. Yes. Um, and teas. Um, more about me. I <laughs> don't know. Okay, perfect. Well, we talked about coffee runs and why they're literally a spiritual experience. Oh, they are. And I think that's something that, like, that was, like, the first thing about you where I was like, wow, this is my friend. Because you're talking about how the whole experience of getting coffee is just so worth every moment of it. Can you unpack the, ex- the spiritual experience? I will that? unpack that. I'll unpack that for all the people back at home right now <laughs> sitting making their at-home coffees that don't understand the vibes that come with going to get a coffee. It's It's not just that, like, if I have a day off, I have ADHD, so I'm always having to do something. Yeah. And if I can spend time, like an hour even, doing my makeup, wearing an outfit that makes me feel super comfortable with myself, driving even (laughs) as part of it, like, I play all my little tunes, all my silly little dance songs, I'm popping in the car to my cute little outfit. I go, I get my coffee. I'm when we talked about this too, I'm hold a gun to the barista's head and I say, <laughs> We're best friends now. Yeah, we are. And I become friends with the baristas and I've done it so many times <laughs> where like I have their Instagrams and we've like hung out and stuff. Because like I said, it's an addiction and it makes it the experience, the entire experience leading up to I it. I think too. this is an addiction that doesn't hurt anyone. No. <laughs> so it's super fine. healthy actually <laughs> is probably the better addiction. Well, not coffee. having my bank account. Oh, no. No, no. I made my at-home coffee today, and then I told Taylor, let's go to Dwell. And I did not order a coffee when I got there. You did already And I was one. sad. I was no. at work today. I know. It was so fun to see you in your element or, like, in the yeah. wild. It was cool. Hearing me call out drinks. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> crazy. Embarrassing. No, and another thing about you is you mentioned your barista friends. I love how easy it is to be friends with you. You're a super, like, open book. And what's your philosophy behind that? Um. Well, I used to not be like that at all I like I've told you before I used to like hide in a hide in a little shell and be quiet and stay away from everyone until I went to the dream center which we'll go into later (laughs) and I absolutely changed as a person and now I cannot go anywhere without asking them about themselves because you could be coming across the coolest person in the world, the sweetest person in the world, yes. someone who could give you the most random piece of advice or just good compliment. And if you don't talk to them, if you don't give everyone a chance, you're missing out on everyone that you come across. Literally. And I think like the the whole narrative that I always heard my whole life was like, you never know who's struggling, like be there for them. No, they're, they're there for me. These random people, like th- I want to unlock these cool people. And like, how would we ha- literally have friends if we weren't friends with everyone? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's so cool. And you're so easy to be friends with and well, you're such an you. honor to know. So um, we talked about your six word testimony but you're going to be a little, you're a little bit of a, um, a little rebel. And I love it because you're yes. going to have yours be seven words, correct? Um, well, yeah, but kind <laughs> of on accident. I'm, I, I could be witty and like try. I thought for a long time after you asked me to do that. <laughs> and I was like, I can't. But uh, no, I think I had it come down to whatever you are. He wants. That's five Ooh, words. Ooh, that's so good. Whatever you are, he wants. I thought it was going to be seven, but I reworded it as it just came out of my mouth. You're such a queen. Look at you. Oh my gosh. I'm such a big fan. So you mentioned Dream Center. Mm-hmm. So I had no idea what any of that was. Okay, fun little story in fact. So I knew of Annie. She had taken my order a hundred million times and she's so precious and kind. And so I knew you because I knew you were like kind and I knew that you were someone that I was like 
neutral on terms with. I wasn't like, oh, she was a jerk or anything like that. <laughs> so, and then Taylor went to go grab me a coffee before our last podcast. And he mentioned, or you, she, he mentioned something about me. And then you mentioned podcast. And then boom, but a boom, we met up for the first time. And now you're on my show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's so cool because you have a story that I was immediately like, wow. Like, this is, this is not unique in the way that other people have struggled with this and you should share that. But then also your story is super mega unique. Like this is not something I've heard before, um, but the common themes are unique. So um, you've been through a lot and you've moved a lot. I want to talk about that first because you have never really settled in a place. Never. So where all have you lived? Share that with us. Um, Well, I could go through all 21 homes. 21? Yes. Oh, my Lord. It's unbelievable to me. I think, I forget where I live half the time. That's fine. (laughs) But um, I've lived multiple times in some states too, but Georgia, South Carolina, California, Texas, Alabama. I think I said that one. Maybe. I, maybe I, I didn't, so. <laughs> but I've lived there too. I've lived in a lot of the same states, but multiple times. Okay, wow. So what was your favorite place to live so far? Either Georgia randomly, Interesting. some of the best people there, or um, California. Okay, but and that is I a love great segue into Dream Center in Dream California. Center. So tell us how you got there, because I think that your obedience is something that a lot of people would not have the courage to step out in. So tell us how you got there. Um, well, I had just moved from Savannah, Georgia to Charleston, South Carolina, which I had already lived there and I did not like it. I actually hated it. Okay. <laughs> if I'm being I didn't completely... like it and in fact I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, and there were a lot of reasons too. I had like experienced a lot of bullying when I lived there and I was I had no friends I just didn't have a good time so to go back there from Savannah where I found a lot of like healing for things I had been struggling with like an eating disorder and mental health issues like other ones that I had been dealing with um because of like my friends yeah and how how they like led me to God and a lot of things that was uh it was a lot to leave I did not want to so I went back, and it was also the middle of my senior year, too. Mm. So I got to Charleston. I was there for about a year and a half, and I was not finding any type of, like, church home or anything. And I had, like, pretty I – I have always had friends in every group. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did have, like, a group of really good, solid, like, Christian friends, too. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't in church with them or anything, and so I – I don't know. I wasn't very rooted in Christ, to be honest. And I felt very far from him, and I didn't care that I was either. Yeah. So for me to have done this, like gone to the Dream Center or even wanted to go on this missions trip, which I'll go into, (laughs) um, was very unlike me. And like I said, I was like super withdrawn and anxious all the time, and I was dealing with a lot. And because I had moved away from such a good, solid foundation, I found myself back in a lot of that. Mm. Um, But I ended up going to this church I kind of didn't like either with this girl (laughs) I actually wasn't even friends with. She wanted to go see this guy she had a crush on. And so I was like, okay, I'll go with you. Isn't that so God, though? Yeah. To take that, like, gross situation and be like, here, let me change your whole life. Yeah. Like, right now, <laughs> let me do it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, he turned my fr- well, my sort of friend's crush into me moving across the country. Um, but I went and th- their youth pastor started talking to me about how they had this missions trip that he was going on or he wanted to go on. And for some reason I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Even though I wouldn't have ever done that on my own because I didn't know anyone. And yeah. I was like four months late on the deadline, but something ticked in my brain. So I was like, <laughs> okay. So I went home and I started praying a little bit and I was like, oh, what is this like do I need to go and so he was like go and then I was like okay but it's four hundred (laughs) dollars yeah I was having to pay a hundred dollars a month like leading up and I was four months behind so I was like lord really four (laughs) hundred dollars um but he said if 
it's if you're gonna go it's not your money anymore so yeah I was like okay it's not my money anymore so I put the 400 down I spoke to the leader of the trip and she was like we actually had one more spot open that we were looking to fill and so I was like well okay I guess this is literally ordained by God or whatever yeah so <laughs> I um I ended up spending all my graduation money and I went on this mission trip and that's how I found out about it. Yeah, so tell us what Dream Center is and about that trip. So the Dream Center is a very large organization that helps like in any area of nonprofit work. And they actually have one in Dallas that does a lot of outreach too. If anybody ever wants to go volunteer, that would be really cool. They're all so sweet there. But um, they they give um, like they give groceries out and they did a lot of that during the pandemic. They have a food kitchen that's always open every day of the week. Um, they help with foster care intervention, um, sex trafficking, homeless, um, people in lower income communities that just need like certain things or even want to find themselves like getting out of it. Yeah. Um, we'll, or we would go um, just be a part of like different neighborhoods. It was called Adopt a Block and we would just find out what their needs were and try to meet them as best we could and genuinely just love on people because the whole mission is to find a need and fill it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't ever about just giving people things and it never yeah. has been. It's about making relationships because that's the only way you're going to help anybody. Yeah, and absolutely. that's where people are truly hurting is their soul. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that's so different from what a lot of other organizations do is they want to talk about loving people and they want to talk about and talk about and talk about and talk about without ever doing anything or they're going to take up an offering for it but you never saw where that money went you never saw your pastor go do that you never saw the members of your church there was never a sign-up sheet you never went but you gave your money and I think that that's there's a place for that absolutely but to be in a place where it's like, no, 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 this is what I do. And from my understanding, it was really intense, like time periods of you doing oh, yeah. this too. It wasn't like once a week we go reach out to a family. It was like, <laughs> we do this every day because this is our calling and our breath is God's. And yeah. so we will use it. Yeah. So what was that? What was your weeks looking like practically? Practically? I mean, it was literally day in, day out yeah. mission work mm -hmm. and um, being the hands and feet of Jesus actively yeah um so i would wake up i was part of their leadership school mm -hmm. so i would take classes in the morning time wait I, wait wait so before we got to school though <laughs> i i started talking about school before we even got done with our trip oh yeah so, we okay didn't talk about i that. got ahead of myself i'm so excited literally this story lights me up so you were on your trip and what happened on your trip that led you to dclf okay well, I was all alone. I was scared. <laughs> I was shaking like a chihuahua every... I got... I can't even explain how sick I got on yeah. the plane. <gasps> no. Y'all can edit this out, but TMI, they always say never poop on a plane. I couldn't help it. <laughs> like, I'm serious. That was too much. I was so anxious, and maybe it was the devil trying to come for me or something, trying to r crash the plane. I don't even know. <laughs> but I was so sick like mm -hmm. with nerves so I got there and I was just nervous the whole time yeah. and then along came my little friend Jansen um <laughs> so I met this girl who I'm still friends with today who I ended up living with there yes. but I met her my first day and I hadn't even met her like leading up to the trip because she um hadn't been at any of the rallies or anything we had but we immediately like we were best friends Aww. And it was, Yay. she made me feel so comfortable and I was able to like kind of do stuff easier there, which honestly she was sent from God at that moment. Aww. But I, um, I got there and I really didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I was excited. And I, um, we, I think it was the second day we went to the church and usually they have people go and clean. Um, but this guy who literally looked like a Pixar character, <laughs> I still think of him today. And he like, he had this shiny bald head. He, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who he is, but shout out to you. Cause thank you. But he was like, we're gonna, we're just gonna take 45 minutes of prayer today. And that's what we're gonna do. So I want everybody to go around and I want everybody to pray. And I was like, I was thinking, I was like, Lord, I haven't prayed to you in like months. Yeah. And I was, I, but I knew something was coming. I could just feel it in my gut. So I started praying 
And I was honestly getting angry because I wasn't feeling anything. I wasn't hearing God say anything. And that had always been my issue was like, I just felt like I couldn't communicate with God in the ways I had hurt other people. And so I was just mad. Yeah. And I was like, God, like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. Like, because at the time I was struggling, deciding what I was doing for college. I was about to move again to Texas. (laughs) Um, And I was just anxious out of my mind. I was in the middle of California. I didn't know anybody. And then he was like, Annie, stop. Literally stop. He let me sit in silence for a long time too. But then he was like, Annie, you can keep gabbing your mouth, but are you going to sit and you're going to listen to me? And so I was like, yes, sir. (laughs) And so I was like, yes. And that's when I learned to just let the Lord speak. Sometimes you've got to pray in silence. Yeah. And, um, I, he was like, if you're going, if you're so worried about your future and you're so scared, like give up on it and give it to me. Yeah. Because he was like, if it, but the thing is, is you can't hold on to it because I was like, well, it can be yours, Lord. Like, yeah, you can, daddy God, you can have my future. Mm -hmm. And then like, I'm still like white knuckling it, like scared for my life. And so he's like, Annie, just let go. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be my future, it has to be mine. It can't be yours anymore. So I was like. Okay. So you were like, so from, from what I'm hearing is like before the trip, like the first time you talked to God in a long time was I'm going on this trip. Yes. And then on the trip, you're like, okay, wait, 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 wait. what did I do this for? Yeah. Because Isn't leading awesome? up, I wasn't like all of a sudden in a deep communication with the Holy Spirit, like yeah. speaking in tongues every night. Like I still had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I was supposed to go. Yeah. And that's so cool that you were so obedient on like a, this is so not me. This is so not me. And I guess that's how you knew that you needed to do it because it wasn't you yeah. at all. So you were talking to the Lord and he was telling you to shut up essentially, <laughs> yeah. which he'll do. And he's cool about that. And what did you hear? He, nothing, actually. He yeah. said, if it's going to be my future, you have to give it up to me. And so yeah. he, and then he didn't tell me what I was going to do. And I was kind of like actually have peace about this yeah and that was the first time like I felt like knots were being untied in my chest that was the first time in a long time I had felt like I was true like I truly was just at peace and yeah. it was crazy because I didn't know what I was doing mm. and I'm like I said I'm always having to know what I'm doing I'm always shaking like a chihuahua you know I love that, <laughs> I love that saying shaking like a chihuahua I'm gonna say that more but yeah so that was that was the moment and yeah. so while you were on that trip you decided on going to their leadership yes. school so that was that was whirlwind crazy. So how did that? What was that like? It was well. That's when he did decide to say something. So I <laughs> yeah. I didn't get totally what you were saying, but um yeah um, I a couple days went went by and it was like a six day trip I think and it was the fourth day and they were just having their regular little DCLS rally, mm-hmm. um trying to get people to like come and join and stuff and it, and it's really upbeat too and I just remember like there was a tunnel of people like holding their hands up like this, like screaming at me while we're running through. Like they play this upbeat video with like some kind of Zed Calvin Harris remix or something. Oh yeah. And then <laughs> like, I'm, but I'm watching it and they're explaining why they love the school and stuff. And I just start crying, like <laughs> bawling my eyes out. And I, I am not a crier at all. Okay, fine. And so I get up and I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, so people won't see me. <laughs> and then I, like this really tall Australian guy, Hayden. My Hayden, favorite part of the story, you guys. Shout out to you. He, he looks at me and he goes, why are you crying? And I'm like, because I just know I'm supposed to be here. And he's like, well, let's get you signed up. Like, what are you doing? Let's not cry about it. This is something to celebrate. And so I'm like, okay. And I start like signing his papers and stuff. It was really funny. And I ended up like coming back and being friends with him a little bit. He's, he's a crazy guy back in australia oh, he got God. deported <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god but yeah that's when i decided to go and so three not three day, days later i with sweet little jansen we get home at four in the morning from driving from the airport from north carolina to south carolina i wake up the next day i slept for like three hours we get, we get coffee and we sign up together Yeah. And we were like, should we go? Should we go? Still questioning it because, you know, old habits die hard. Yeah. But there was literally a globe at the coffee shop and I remember spinning it and I was like, wherever it lands, if it lands on LA, I have to do it. (laughs) And then my finger stopped on LA and I was like, oh my gosh. 
Jesus. <laughs> For real. I know. For real. So you went to school. Yeah. And what was, okay, so we already kind of went over like what your schedule was like. It was like all outreach essentially. Yeah, basically. And then they were pouring into y'all a pretty good bit. Okay, yeah. awesome. It was, it was a, it's a mixture of both. I feel like a lot you feel like you were not getting anything. And that's the brutal honesty of it. Yeah. Like not the, um, like you don't get helped or taught or anything. Like you do have the first half of your day taking yeah. classes. But sometimes you sh- truly just feel drained being there. Yeah. I mean, that's that's people. People yeah. are draining and loving people is not easy. That's why we have to incline our heart to do that because it will not do it naturally. It's not comfortable. Yeah. I think that's so cool. So you were there for how long? I was there for, it's honestly pretty choppy because of COVID, but mm-hmm. two years essentially. Two years essentially. And it's not a two-year program. It's longer than that. It, it can go up to three years. Okay. Um, the first two years are the technical DCLS years, and then the third year, it's immersion. So you would kind of be working as just purely an intern. Okay, there. perfect. That makes yeah. sense. So while you were there, like, what changed about you? Like, what did the Lord do? Oh, my goodness. Everything. <laughs> um, no. So I've already talked about um, my ability to speak to people now. Mm-hmm. Um, but... He was just uprooting and pulling stuff out of me that I didn't even know I had in me there. And a lot of it, I was I was not even looking to have changed. So, like, I got there, and first of all, he put me on the worship team. So, <laughs> that and that, I got there, and I was like, why, Jesus? Like, I'm <laughs> here. This is my first day. And yeah. they surprised us with, like, auditions and stuff. And then God's like, you're going to be on the and I'm like no I'm not (laughs) um because I I've always liked to sing but I will not even sing in front of my siblings or I wouldn't Mm -hmm. um so that um pushed me out of my comfort zone and through that I found a lot of like um heal randomly healing and like self-hatred yeah. And the things that I thought I would never be able to do because it was the look I had on myself. I think, like, I got rid of a lot of that because when you have, not for me to be praised, honestly, even thinking about it now, I'll say this, I haven't even thought about it, but God, like, showing me who I am and why I am not hated because yeah. of him, come, like, being shown through me Yeah, on a platform like that. Um, so like, obviously I, no part of me is being seen. My voice is just being used. Yeah. Um, and I think that that made me realize like, it isn't about me. It it actually never was. I am living in this little body (laughs) with this little mind and God's just going to use it however he wants. It's not about me. Yeah. And then, so I was able to work, work through a lot of that. And then, um, just like the community I was put into, helped me with that and a lot of anxiety was gone I um I became very outgoing and like all the span of eight months yeah. um but and there are so many things I could go into you you'd probably have to ask me a question because there's so much in my brain I'm yeah like, no, no because this. one thing you have mentioned to me a lot I think we said it earlier in the podcast and if we didn't I'm gonna just say it now um is like you were very Oh, yeah, we said this. You were very, like, withdrawn and anxious. Like, how did the Lord heal those things for you? Like, was that while you were there? Or is that, obviously, it's ongoing healing. Yeah. Healing is forever. But, like, so you would not have just randomly met up with me. That would have not been a thing. Oh, yeah, no. So he increased your boldness. Talk about that. He, in- he did increase my boldness because I think a lot of it came from, um, and maybe this is part of my five word testimony, but wherever I was at and all the times in my life where I thought I wasn't well equipped, mm-hmm. um, or something I was dealing with made me like, made it harder for me to connect with people. He actually used to connect with people. Yeah. So I think like the reason why I am so able to just talk to random people now is because Like, when you're going into somebody else's neighborhood and possibly home, and you're just, like, talking to them, and you're like, hey, how are you? Like, invading in their life, and they're like, I literally have no idea who you are. You just came up to my front door. (laughs) Um, He he made it to where I was able to truly connect with people who, literally, if I think about too much, I'll cry because I love them so much. But, like, in 
for example, mental illness or something. Mm -hmm. Like, the places where I thought I was lacking, he was like, no, I'm going to fill it up and use it there. Yeah. So I, um, for example, like, there's this, there's this lady, Miss D, mm -hmm. and um, I feel like, or I'll start with this, I feel like a lot of times we have to be very closed off with our true struggles in Christianity or in a, ch a church culture um, because imperfection looks like there might be something wrong with our relationship with God. Yeah. Because, like, well, even, and it's such a prosperity mind sp mindset, but, like, j just because you pray, like, doesn't mean that all of a sudden God's going to take away this anxiety, for example. Yeah. Because all the amount of times I've, like, begged God to take this away from me, and he hasn't, it it gets discouraging, yeah. honestly, because you're like, why do I deserve this? But there was this woman, Miss D, who I would, she was in a wheelchair and I would go to her house and I would just patch holes in her walls and stuff because she would always be hitting her walls and putting holes in them with her little oh, wheelchair. No. <laughs> and so every week I would go back and patch the same hole up and let it dry. And I was like, it's okay, I'll get you some metal guards and stuff. And it was just funny because I'm always patching up the same holes. But yeah. it created a little relationship with this lady who I love so dearly. And I was able to talk to her about how we both struggled with bipolar disorder. Yes. And she is um, older. Mm -hmm. So it w the age gap was also a lot to like come by and like connect through because, you know, age gaps yeah, make stuff you have, harder Yeah, like zero sometimes. in common pretty yeah. much. Yeah, but we were just talking and she started asking me if I could like hand her her meds or something and I was like, oh, I'm on these. And we started talking yeah. about these like twins. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was like, you know, every time I feel like I'm around like Christian people, I feel like I need to be done up and pretty. And I feel like I need to like be good before I go to church. But mm -hmm. like all the th all the ways that like I felt like I haven't been good enough, I feel like you deal with them too, but you're so open about it. And I feel like I can talk to you about it, but still yeah. talk about God. And I'm like, well, that's why I'm here. You know, and I think that that's something that no one ever told us we couldn't talk about, but we just... We just knew. Like, it was yeah. like an unwritten rule. Like, we do not talk about these things. There are certain things that it's okay to struggle with. Mm -hmm. Other things, nope. If you struggle with those, do not say it. Yeah. Like, you will never get a leadership position. You will never be in power. You will never not be in power. But, like, you'll never be able to rise to the authority that God wants you in because people. And they're going to think, oh, my gosh. Like, she struggles with her brain. Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. Because, I don't know. And, like, your story with mental illness is pretty unique. And we talked about that. So, uh, however much you feel comfortable sharing with that, I would love to hear about. Yeah, no, I will always talk about mental illness in the church because yeah. because it needs to be in the way more people struggle than, you know, like it's just yeah. it's not just people in your school and like kids that you come across like dying from it. It's like people you see face to face every day. Yeah. And if you're not in your church, like using the power of God in that or promoting like an openness about it and how to find God in it, then yeah, and it doesn't look a certain way, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I was, we were jokingly listening to the song Emo Girl by <laughs> MGK earlier. Plug, great song. Yeah. Don't, don't hate me because I love Jesus and MGK. Anyway, um, but we were listening to that song and I was like, that's so funny. Like, but like, what if people heard us on the podcast listening to that? Like, what are, like it doesn't have to look a certain way. Like, yeah. people all look different in the way that people deal with their emotions and their feelings and their diagnosis. Diagnoses? Yeah. Is that... I don't know. Diagnoses is the <laughs> is up to them, and everyone looks different in their mental illness. Like there are plenty of people that I've met that look like the happiest people ever, but they, yeah. you know, struggle with these horrible manic episodes or something like that. So it's like, yeah, it doesn't have to look a certain way, and it doesn't have to be dealt with a certain way either, mm -hmm. because the Lord's will is to heal it no matter yeah. what. Yeah, and I think that's so cool, and I hate that we don't talk about that as a culture. Yeah, I know, and I think that it does keep people from like being in leadership positions too in a church yeah, or in like a position where they feel like they can, they can mentor somebody or just be yeah. able to like speak about it and feel validated in it. Because I, I mean, like I, you and I talked about it, but I have been seriously hurt by this. And to be honest, like the reason why I didn't go back my last year of the dream center and like, I will, I'll keep this part pretty, um, 
vague. Yeah, but um, was because of my mental illness, and it made me feel very invalidated. Yeah, because I was told by someone in leadership who I don't think understood my situation or how I was even doing. I was told that I wasn't mentally healthy enough to come back, yeah. even though I had been there for two years prior, dealing with two at least one round of about the hardest depression I've ever been through. Yeah. So like I had done it, I had been through it, I had grown and like all while doing outreach and stuff. And so I was mad, I was a little mad. I was like, okay, I've been doing this for however long and now I'm not prepared. And I think like Satan definitely took some of that and like got a stronghold in my brain, like dug a little hole and he was like, I'm sitting here because you're not qualified. And like you get, you feel like that, you feel like, well, how do I not know that I'm going to get bad again? Or how do I not know that, like, I'm going to be mentally stable enough to be able to help take care of other people? But like my little five-word testimony is, no matter who, how you are, who you are, where you are, what you're doing, like, God wants that. Yes. And that's it. And he was not surprised whenever these things are part of your mental health journey. Whenever bipolar disorder is a part of that, that did not surprise him and say, oh, I'm not going to call her to actually anything because that'll yeah. just hold her back forever. Like, no, he said, no, I'm going to call her higher and deeper because she's my child. She's my daughter before she's ever a victim of this yeah. disease or a sufferer of this disease. Like, she's my daughter first. And I think that that is really painful to have that taken away from you. And also, you, you told me um, beforehand, like, you were vulnerable with her, with that individual, Mm -hmm. and then she used that against you. And how did that make you feel, and how will that make you feel as you move into your future of ministry and nonprofit? Well, it made me feel very misunderstood and invalidated because, like I said, like, I actually, when she told me that, I was doing the best I had in a while, but I had just come out of the worst I had ever had. And so I was like, okay, well, she doesn't understand this. So it made me feel very invalidated because she used the words, well, how do you know it's not going to get bad again to me? And I was like, okay, well, I don't. Yeah. Um, And that made me just so scared and feel like, okay, well, I mean, like if it's just going to get bad again, like what's the point, you know? Like how do I know that I have anything to give people now? Because if like I look so little and unequipped to her, like being able to lead these people or being able to help people or even being able to, I don't know, this was my mindset. I was like, how am I going to do it? But then I realized like, it's not, well, how am I going to help them fix them? Da, 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 da. Like, Mm. I'm not going to, we can't fix people. It's not about that. It's about, and as God taught me that whole previous year, it's that all I have is enough. Yeah. And, like, I don't have to help people. I, sometimes I just have to sit with them. Yeah. God will help them. Yeah. Like, and I, all I have to do is be there. And he, like, if he called me equipped, if he had put me there for those two years, knowing that I had already been dealing with this, then why would I believe that I had nothing to give or nothing to, like, be used for? Mm-hmm. So now I think, like, no matter what I go into, I am always going to want to give, like, grace and like love to people dealing with mental illness because that does not unequip you. It it gaps bridges and like heals things with people that someone with a perfectly healthy mind would never understand. Like it's completely necessary. Yes. And now you go into that situation and you have a whole different authority than anyone else ever did to speak to that person. And then your voice is the only one that can speak Mm -hmm. healing. Because we would, we would see it completely differently if, your mom had gone through cancer and my mom had gone through cancer. Yeah. Like we could both talk about that all day long and be able to understand each other completely. Mm-hmm. But I can't, it's like hitting a brick wall with a baseball bat. Like yeah. when you have a mentally healthy person that might, I mean, God can give you the words, obviously. Yeah. But you yourself are not going to understand it unless you've been through it. Yeah. You know? And I think that's such a superpower that you have now. What would you say to the Annie that just got that news? What would you say to her right now? Like the news that she doesn't get to come back? Um, I'd say, I don't know where, I still don't know where you're going, honey, but you gotta, (laughs) you gotta trust. Yeah. And so you don't have like a super concrete plan right now. And I think that's so cool because one thing that I love is like, a lot of people want to be able to tie up their story with a nice little pretty bow and be like, and that's what God did. Okay, bye. And like yeah. make a cute little Instagram post about it. But you're in the middle of it. 
you are just sitting in the middle. I'm always in the middle of it. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's where exactly where you need to be, unfortunately. But so you're just kind of chilling, waiting on the Lord right now. Oh, yeah. So what does this season look like? What are you, what are you, what in you is being prepared for something that you don't know you're being prepared for? If that makes sense. Like, what is the Lord working on you right now? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, right now, I think I'm just, God's telling me, like, to just fall back on him again. Yeah. Because I think, I'm going to be honest, like getting home from the Dream Center wasn't the healthiest or best for me. Like I did take it hard. Um, and then my green on top of that didn't make it easier. <laughs> so I think God is just you know, like, Annie, no matter what it looks like, I'm here. Yeah. Because I am such a, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. <laughs> yeah. Like I want to run around and like own the world. But I can't do anything. Yeah, that's so fun and crazy and wild. And I love it. And I love your story. And so I wanted to briefly talk about the title of the show because we were, like, joking about what to call it. And, yeah, so tell us about that. Uh, God loves people with blue hair, too. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And I think that um, you might take this the wrong way, but I hope you don't because you're cool. You don't look like a little Christian girly. You know what I mean? Thank you. And I love that. That's what I like. <laughs> and I love that about you because, like, you don't strike me as, like, someone who went to leadership school and, like, has done Jesus things. And that's a character defect on my part because you didn't look a certain way. I was like, whatever. She's super nice. So, I mean, she's got something going, right? You know what I mean? So, I think that that's really cool that you're, like, breaking that mold and that you don't have to look like everyone else or be like everyone else or... Like, even your Instagram, I look at it, and I'm like, she's the artsiest, coolest person in the world. Yeah. And I'm just like, what the heck? Like, you're you're so unique and different, and that's so your superpower. Thank you. And it's such an honor to know you, and I'm so glad you were on today. Um, and, yeah, so I guess we'll close out. And, Annie, it's been an honor. And Thank I you will for see you next having time. me.